Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the show this week as I welcome you every week to my favorite part of the week, and I hope yours as well, the chance that I get to introduce you to amazing people that inspire, that motivate, that transform ways of thinking. And and these are people that I've met along my walk of life, along my business, or somebody that I've been introduced to by somebody else along the way of my journey. And I'm really pleased to be able to have my next guest on the show. I reached out to them because they rebranded their company just recently. After being in business, I think this is the second rebranding they've done, or maybe it's the third, since 1927. And in 2019, they're still going. It's still a family business, but it is a world-dominating business for those of us who are authors and in the business book world and more. And I've been honored to be on their business bestseller list. They're transforming the way we do business. And Sally Halderson is the woman who runs the business for the family-owned business. And she's here with us today. And Sally, welcome to the show. Thank you, Laura, for having me. I am really excited to chat with you. Yeah, me as well, because, you know, to me, and the last few weeks on the show, I've been doing a whole series on book publishing. It wasn't Mm -hmm. planned. It just kind of happened. So I love to sort of roll with the way the guests sort of line up. (laughs) You know, I've had somebody who's total focused, Jane Ubell Myers, um, last week talking about book marketing, I had David Hancock, mm-hmm. founder of Morgan James Publishing, who was how I originally got to what is now Porchlight Book Company, but was mm-hmm. 800 CEO Read when I came right. out with my book. And you've been there for a long time. I have. I still feel very young, though, so that's a good thing. And I think that um, we often get fed by the work that we do, and I'm very lucky to um, work for a company and do a job that I love very much that energizes me. And I think that's the wonderful thing about being in books, in being in publishing, is that there's a constant stream of new ideas, and that not only feeds you as a person, but it can also feed the company itself. And so we always say that there's sort of this sort of, you know, meta strength that we have because we actually sell all the good ideas that we sort of take into um, our company and feed the, you know, already really awesome DNA that we have, but we sort of feed it with all of this new and novel and inspiring um, marketplace of ideas that we work in. There's a a philosophy that you guys have that I love, and, and that's this idea that we are united by books. And Mm -hmm. this is right on your website, and I love this. The idea that everything from government and health care to education and even our personal lives should be run like a business driven by the bottom line has come to dominate our culture over the past 40 years. As a company that is focused on business books and thinking, as that has taken place, we've come to realize that business is and should be informed by a wider lens of current events, culture, personal development, environment concerns, and the public good. And then you go on to talk about how rather than push the values of business into every corner of our lives, that you want to join a chorus of voices bringing the richness of the rest of our lives into business and to inform organizations with holistic human values. I mean, that to me is not what you hear about businesses nowadays. (laughs) We, um, you know, are very inspired by the challenge of – as I mentioned before, seeing tradition and taking it and turning it on, if not turning it on its head, turning it on its side, right? And um, we, have a, we have many things about our company that are very traditional. In fact, our roots are, as you mentioned in the intro, you know, we've been around for, since 1927. But when you look at our story, even though, you know, we're almost 100 years old, When you look at our story, it's really an entrepreneurial story, and it's really about 
reaching out to people through the medium of books. And so in 1927, um, to make a long story hopefully short enough, I could probably take the whole hour um, just talking about the history of the company because it really is fascinating. But um, we started out as this tiny little publisher in the back of a hair salon on Downer Avenue in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And Harry W. Schwartz uh, published a piece by Faulkner, and um, there's, a, there's a more sort of detailed history on the website. Um, but so we really have our roots in literature, and, we start, and they started to open bookshops in Milwaukee. And um, eventually, by about um, mid-1990s, they had nine stores, including um, ours, which at that point was called Schwartz Business Books. And so the Schwartz family have gone, have um, created this company that was this tiny little publisher to a company that had nine stores, including this really innovative business book-centric bulk seller that really um, became integral to the publishing industry. And that's one of the reasons why United by Books is such a powerful message for us, because we feel like we're now in the intersection of all things publishing. You know, we're kind of publishing adjacent, but we're also sort of in the middle. We talk to authors and publishers and agents and um, journalists and, uh, you know, printing presses and book clubs. And we do all of this work to try to communicate um, and solve the needs that each of these groups have so that we're all sort of connected and getting more great ideas out there via books. What do you think it is about books that has kept them at the forefront of change in our world today? I mean, to me, books more than any other medium has the ability to touch a heart, trigger a movement, and put a light in the darkness compared mm -hmm. to nothing else in the world. I think, you know, it's funny, as I'm sure you're aware, and, and I'm sure your listeners are aware, just a handful of years ago, we heard the death knell of books, right? Right. We heard, you know, <laughs> the, you know books are dead, publishing industry is antiquated, Radio um, is you know, dead. Are gonna be, <laughs> yeah, everything's going to be read online. Uh, nothing's ever going to, you know, be made of paper and cardboard. And, um, you know, we're all ready to be put out to pasture. And what's been interesting about, you know, I've been with this company for 21 years, and we've gone through many, many iterations of um, the the industry itself. But what's interesting about the last you know, 10 years as a whole, but even a shorter amount of time, as we look at sort of that idea of um, books are going to be replaced by online or by uh, digital readers, that kind of thing. We saw that peak a few years ago, and then it's sort, you know, it's sort of um, come down off its peak, not to say that people don't read online, but I think we do so much reading online of short pieces that there's something still very involving and very um, uh, I find captivating it captivating about being in a long in a long longer piece in a bigger thought right so right. That's, I think there's something about human nature that really wants to engage with something and doesn't just want to sit on the top on the surface of it but with what's interesting about the evolution of like the significance of books. You know, I have a lot of theories about this. I could talk about this forever, but we have um, the person who used to run 800 CEO Read uh, before we've now changed our name, Jack Covert. He had this theory that um, for business thinkers in particular, books are a 200 page calling card or business card, right? And right. so you want to leave someone with your name and with your idea. And that's what a book for a business author or someone who, you know, commands big audiences really is. And I sort of have this theory now as we've seen the evolution of um, independent bookstores. 
uh, lots of them closing, now many of them reimagining their business model and making it work now, and the same thing with our company, is that books are a little bit more like concert t-shirts. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way at all or in a superficial way, but that it's really about, books are really about community. Reading is still a solitary activity, but books are a community and they represent who you are externally, right? The books on your bookshelf represent who you are. You know, there's a little bit of a reflection of who you are. It represents what's in your brain. But it's also when you have these book clubs or you have these big arena shows where books are what people take home from there. It's their souvenir. It represents their soul. It represents how smart they are. It represents what they want to be like. And so there's, this, there's all this meaning that is reflected through books far beyond the idea that comes through from the author, which, of course, is very important as well. I love how you just did that, that idea that books are like concerts. I had all these feelings and emotions, and and then I remembered this moment when I did an opening keynote at an author conference and talked mm-hmm. about my book for the first time, and there were about 400 people in the room. Mm-hmm. And I, I held up a copy of my book, and I was talking about it, and the place went wild. And then they ran to the back of the room to get the free copies of the books that my sponsors had arranged for, mm-hmm. which, by the way, I ordered from 800 CEO Reads that day <laughs> <laughs> with tip in pages Excellent. and everything, which was pretty mm-hmm. awesome. It is, you know, authors really are rock stars, whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, a small community event and there's only 15 people in the room or five people in the room, or it's like when I interviewed Nicholas Sparks on stage at an event mm-hmm. with a 1,000 people for <laughs> one of his book launches. That's huge. Totally rock stars, and I never thought of it that way, but they're, they're there. They, as you said, people put books on their shelves because that's what people, they want people to think about them or it's mm-hmm. what they want to think about themselves. It's who they mm-hmm. want to be as people are defined often by sometimes the only way they can get access to that information is through a book. Right. I think that um, what's fascinating then if we sort of extrapolate out from um, you know, books are, are concept t-shirts and authors are rock stars, that um, it can come in all shapes and sizes as well, of course. Um, last year, our number one book was um, one of the, this, you know, when we get into why we rebranded and that kind of thing, this is a good representative of the reasons why, but um, our number one book was There's More from Hillsong Church in uh, Australia. And we shipped almost 60,000 books to arenas all over the country for events. And wow. so that is, as, as you had the experience, um, you know, it's all about that community bringing people together. But at the same time, on the other side, we did a lot of work with, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Peach Truck, um, but it's a Nashville couple who's really famous for their peaches. And they drive around and sell their peaches out of a truck. And they did a cookbook um, called the Peachtree Cookbook. And that cookbook, you know, they're driving around. They need, they're not going to also have a truck full of books, you know, following their peach truck. And, but they want to get that, um, you know, their recipes and the things that they believe in um, and their creativity out into the world. And so they drive their truck and we send their books. And I think that um, whether we're talking about, you know, tens of thousands of people in one arena or we're talking about um, a few people at every stop, that it really is all about um, community in a way that is tangible and that can't really be found on, you know, watching a TV show or reading something online. I mean, sure, you know, we have message boards and we have group chats and things like that but there's something very tangible still about a book that i think people um really long for and 
you know, there's so many thoughts going through my head right now and until I can formulate that one question that I want to ask. I want to touch a little bit on the rebranding, the name changing, because you just mentioned it several times with, mm-hmm. with sort of the impetus for it. You've been known forever as 800 CEO Read, mm-hmm. and for those of us who write business books and people who buy business books, the go-to place. Right. Mm -hmm. And now as a company, as a people in the world of books, you rebranded to Porchlight Book Company. Mm -hmm. You talked about this. There is more from Hillsong and the peach truck from cookbooks, not books that really people knew that you were known for and could get for from you to change a corporation around that is not struggling, mm-hmm. is doing really well, to say mm-hmm. to, to the world, we're more than who you think we are, and we want to welcome you to who we fully are. Right. That happened overnight. <laughs> you gave me chills when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's been um, a really fun and somewhat nail-biting journey over the last few years. Um, we were, we have been um, 800 CEO read for at least two decades. And we have, um, you know, we really believe in, and so I just, you know, to any listener who is a small business owner or an entrepreneur, um, we really believe in the value of the niche, right? Like we really believe that when you can stay, when you're small and you can stay focused on one specialty, that that's where you can really get your um, traction. And so we did that. We focused on business books. Um, we recognized the fact that um, that's where bulk book sales are most needed. Um, one of the challenges of owning a bookstore, a brick and mortar bookstore, is that you have to have a lot of inventory when it comes for us, we were an, we became an on-demand store primarily for a long time. And so we didn't have to keep that inventory. And instead, we developed these really great relationships with publishers um, where, you know, we really worked together to get books where they needed to be when they needed to be there. And because there are a lot of, you know, corporate events and um, business speakers, you know, there's a lot of change and a lot of um, striving that happens in business. And so there's a lot of book authors who are really addressing the need for change, um, you know, a guide to success. You know, your friend and ours, Bob Berg, has um, the perennial bestseller, uh, Go-Giver. Which Love is, that you man. Know, he about, and John David Mann, just dear friends. Yeah, ah, wonderful. About him. Being, being the best person um, within a company, you know, so it's not down, um, you know, we can go way back to say like the mid 1980s when business books were really about the corporation. It was really about strategy. It was about, um, you know, sort of people, companies learning to not take people, the people who work in their companies for granted and to give them um, something more than just being a cog in a wheel. And as business books evolved, it brought more and more of that humanity into business. And the business book genre really started to evolve with people like Malcolm Gladwell and Susan Cain, Dan Pink, where a lot of these books are about human behavior within a business or within capitalism, I guess, as you know, in the larger society. And so we started you know, recognizing the fact that that was an evolution that was happening. And as people bought those books that were really about the person within the culture, then culture books started coming into play. And we started ordering books for um, the business lifestyle. You know, there are people who not only want the best for themselves in terms of their work, and they want the best of them from themselves in terms of productivity and creativity, but they also want a lifestyle that is um, matches all of those ambitions and really fulfills them in all places. So we started selling those books, 
and we know that wellness books and cookbooks and lifestyle books are all incredibly popular in, with that same audience. And so that's sort of what inspired um, our name change is that, is that experience with um, business is more than business now, and it really is about the humans that make up business. It's like your, your clients and your, not only your clients, but because your clients are, are so diverse, right? So your clients are mm-hmm. us authors, but mm-hmm. your clients are also the people that are buying the author's books. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's like they defined and set up who you guys were going to be. But unlike so many other companies that don't pay attention to that, mm-hmm. You and and the, your CEO Rebecca Schwartz, family Schwartz, and mm-hmm. and everybody else inside your your company said, "Whoa, wait a minute! This is really who we've become, and we need to let go who we were." Right. But that's not something a lot of businesses just do, and then they miss that boat. Mm-hmm. As Daniel Burris, the antip- anticipatory mm-hmm. organization, wrote. You've anticipated where the next trend is, and I love that. I, I think a lot of that has to do with listening, right? And um, I, I sort of want to answer that question in two different ways, and one of them is the sort of larger um, publishing industry um, look in the sense that, you know, as with all things, when, you know, Amazon happened, <laughs> which my a good my way of favorite, putting it. Amazon um, happened. <laughs> yes, Amazon happened. It's the best way to say it. And in fact, I was hired um, just months before Amazon happened. To um, when I was hired at Schwartz Business Books, and I was hired to get all the new orders that were going to come in from the fax machine when we sent out our paper catalog. That's how old I am. But <laughs> <laughs> then Amazon happened. And, you know, we needed to respond to a change like that. But responding in the sense of just reacting to a competitor made little sense to us when in actuality we are serving so many um, people who were sort of challenged by that same challenge we were having. You know, publishers came up against Amazon. Other bookstores came up about, against Amazon. Authors are trying to figure out this new front, you know, technological frontier. And so working in service to those people or those clients rather than just positioning ourselves as a competitor made a lot of sense to us. And that's sort of an approach we've had for you know, decades now that we are more interested, and I love the name of your show because we are far more interested in going and having meetings with, um, you know, some of our friends in publishing and saying, what do you need? You know, what can we do to solve your stickiest problem? Like, what, because as you know, authors, see what other authors have, they see what other people are doing, and they're like, we would love to do that, and we would like to, do, you know, get this audience, and we would like to build this platform, and publishers aren't necessarily equipped for really helping authors in a um, an immediate kind of way, because they're really working on a schedule that's very different from the schedule that the authors are working on after the book is published. Oh, that's so very true. We're going to be going into national news, so let's hold that thought here. We are here, I am here, (laughs) with Sally Halderson, um, the general manager of Porchlight Books, formerly 800 CEO. She just lives and breathes strategy and and how to define yourself in an ever-changing world of business and life, and we'll be right back. I have a feeling you and I can just talk for days and days and days. Yep. You talk about when Amazon happened and that you guys made this choice to take that as an opportunity to not, as Bob Berg always says, don't react, respond. But you mm-hmm. didn't just respond. 
you said Heckworth responding to Amazon. We understand there's more to what's happening than just Amazon. Mm-hmm. That's not yeah. the way most people would react in a situation. <laughs> It's a, it, we do feel, you know, the book industry is a bit of a microcosm of other uh, business industries or areas as well, because there are the, you know, 500 pound gorillas out there where, you know, everyone is trying to find the niche and find their customer. And, um, you know, w- we've learned a lot from a lot of the books that we sell. Um, and I think that the key is to for our, our sort of evolution was determining, you know, who we wanted to serve. And I mentioned that before the break, that um, we were really interested in um, relationships. And one of the things that, you know, there are a lot of things that Amazon does very well and that a small company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, can't possibly try to replicate. And so... Why should we, right? We have other people who are interested in developing relationships with one another within the book industry and in a way that isn't algorithmic and isn't, um, you know, sponsored ads for this and um, all the information you could ever want versus, you know, very thoughtful recommendations of books we really believe in that we really believe can, can change a person's life. Um, that we really um, understand the, the struggle and triumphs of being an author and really trying to make that process as easy as possible with the logistics and um, sort of the, the constellation of services that we have. We know that publishers want success for their authors, but they have so many, you know, they're, they're pulled in a million different ways and they are trying to respond to um, cultural and technological change as well. And so there's a lot of um, responding and giving that kind of service on a daily basis is far more satisfying and inspiring than trying to compete with a faceless giant. And um, the more that we can do so that we can connect, um, the more satisfying and the more connections we can make. Yet it's not how a lot of businesses react when that 800-pound gorilla walks in. Mm -hmm. They sit there and they go into fear. And Mm -hmm. then they feel, well, that's the way I need to structure my business and I need to either curl up and die, which I've seen mm-hmm. many people do, or I have to go along the common ground. Yet Porchlight, formerly 800 CEO Reads, has always chosen to go in their own way, including the way they treat their employees mm-hmm. and their willingness to go that extra mile for them. And it's we been have- such success. I mean, you yourself, Mm -hmm. over the course of your 21 years with them, Mm -hmm. have seen them treat you like family and adjust when you've had your own personal crisis. That's not common. I, I, you know, we can't speak for every family business and we can't speak for every business, um, you know, full stop. But we have... um, Right now, we have, I believe, about 17 employees. We have, we do have um, temps and such who come in and help us with some of the work that we have to do. But generally speaking, um, our the family behind the company wants to offer employees um, real, satisfying, full-time, challenging. Uh, sort of potential um, uh, maximizing <laughs> jobs. And it has created a kind of um, family system here that extends beyond blood family. And so just from the group of people that we have here, I've been here for 21 years, and out of our less than 20 people, there are people who have been here longer. 
So we have people who have been here 25 and 22 and many people who have been here at least a decade because we know that this is a really special place to work. And um, if you will permit me uh, probably a fairly tired um, metaphor, I'm not the first person to use a tree as you know, an example of how a good business should work. But I think for our company, the, in terms of it being a family company, but also being very invested in the people, is that you know, in family businesses, and I, you know, not all family businesses are like, you know, the family on HBO's Succession, right? Right. <laughs> Where there's all of this drama and trading and and um, jockeying for position and all of that kind of stuff. But there certainly is a component to family businesses that are very different than having, um, you know, independent stakeholders or investors and that kind of thing. That the family itself is is the roots of the company, right? Their history is, is the company. And so they're very, um, it's not the only thing that they're looking at, of course, and I don't want to say that that's, this is in isolation, but they're very concerned about the roots of the company, right? And, and longevity, history, stability, um, in terms of our, the family that runs our company, they're very interested in keeping this business going so that we all have jobs. And not just that they have, you know, their own history, but the, so we all do. And then as, you know, as deep as the roots go, it then feeds the tree. And so all of the people who work here are the trunk of the tree. And we are as stable and strong and um, imbued with energy as the people here are um, also energetic and growth-focused and... Um, invested in the success of the company. And I could go on and I can say that, you know, the branches are the business model and the services and the leaves are the customers. But the most important here is that the fruit then, you know, grows and can be enjoyed. But it also, at the end of every season, lots of fruit falls to the ground. And that profit, if we'll say the fruit is the profit, then gets you know, reabsorbed by the soil, which then gets taken in by the roots, and the, you know, the family makes the profit that then gets reinvested into the trunk, and that's a really important cycle that we are very lucky to have as a company, that the, that the fruits of our labor really do, you know, get funneled back into the company, and this rebrand, for example, was a huge investment and risk for the company that's very, you know, um, concerned about roots and history and stability to take this big chance on um, really changing the story of the company to reflect what's next versus what has been. And, and they have fed the tree in that way, in a way that hopefully will continue to create that cycle. And you're doing some really interesting things. I mean, you guys always have, but you have, you put out every week uh, nonfiction bestseller lists every month, right, mm -hmm. alongside your business bestseller list. You have, mm -hmm. uh, I think this year you are doing your book awards as well, business yep. book awards, right? Mm -hmm. And that's open right now as well, is it not? It is. Yes. So people can um, apply and submit their book to mm -hmm. potentially winning a business book award from from you guys. That's that's not an area that most people are going with trying to create their own their own lists. There's the New York mm -hmm. Times bestseller list and all that. Right. I'm not going to tell you that I don't want my book to be there. I have right. to tell you that day that I heard I hit your bestseller list, mm -hmm. I would. I, my mother was still alive back then, and she couldn't understand mm -hmm. what the dream was, and she's like, you're okay? I'm like, oh, my God, I hit this list I've wanted to hit. <laughs> and and it was really powerful that you're doing things to help authors get themselves known where a lot of other venues are, it's not possible to do that. Mm -hmm. They... 
you get published, whether it's through a traditional publisher, a hybrid publisher, or self-publishing, or whatever it is. And then a lot of people are like, okay, well, there's nothing else I can do. But sometimes it takes more than launch week for a book mm-hmm. to to really find its audience. And that's what you do. How do you how do you help people do that? I mean, you're there when all other resources just sort of stop. You're there still helping the authors find their audience so that they can transform the world with their words. I, our focus really is about, um, I'll back up just a, just a little bit here, and I'll give my the hat tip to, um, you know, we employed a local marketing company here to help us with our rebrand um, and called Hanson Dodge, and they really looked into, um, you know, what makes us us, they talked to a lot of people um, who are our clients and customers and talked about the things that are, you know, really valuable about what we're doing. And as you mentioned, um, m- many of the services that we offer, for lack of a better word, don't make us money in terms of, you know, like the bottom line. Um, there's no, uh, you know, gross profit on service necessarily in it's the way that, that um, just it. selling a book right. is. And, but we feel like um, through a lot of our investigation, one of the brand defining ideas that um, created the, porch, the new Porchlight name is that we want to keep books human. And we mean that in the broader sense, right? The book industry, we want to keep it human. And so we really hear what it is that authors are struggling with, how they feel fulfilled in the great hard work that they've done. Um, I'm a writer as well, and a number of the, many of the people here are artists, and we know what the struggle is to get, um, to get an audience and to get our ideas out there. And we feel very committed to um, that there are, unheard voices, that's one thing. Um, We're very aware and constantly discussing the fact that, um, just like our culture, that there are a lot of voices out there that aren't heard, and we want to amplify those those voices. Um, We do that through all of these ways that aren't necessarily quantifiable. But, um, you know, we are lucky to be good friends with um, Seth Godin, who, you know, that's a man who uh, walks the talk, and he is always ready with an idea, and he does such great work, and we're lucky to partner with him on his um, MBA online course. But he used to run a site called Change This, which he gave to us um, probably about 15 years ago. And we've taken that um, site, and it's a great opportunity for new authors or authors who just have a book published or had a book published a year before to write a manifesto about something they believe in and have that published with a beautiful cover put on it. And um, we promote it. The author promotes it. You can use it for anything because it's really owned by the author. And so those are the things that we really want to keep building on. Um, You know, we really want to be authentic in keeping books human, and that means addressing the needs of the humans who make them. I love that whole concept and that whole idea about them because all you hear about nowadays in the world of publishing is the algorithms, is Mm -hmm. what's what's the algorithm now? Amazon changed their algorithm and you're going to have a harder time getting things put up there. But if you focus Google, on... As you, Google, Amazon, Google. <laughs> yes, exactly. Then the human element is what really makes things go viral. The people mm-hmm. that connect to the idea, the feeling, right? the learning, that's how things keep moving forward. And Some of the best... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. 
some of the best feedback that we get, and this is as in good feedback in terms of what makes us feel like we're doing our jobs every day is we have an amazing um, editorial director here who writes many of our reviews and he deeply engages with the books that he reviews. And we have authors who, you know, share those reviews on um, in social media by saying, I can't believe this person actually read my book. And I don't mean that other people aren't, but like, that someone really engaged with the ideas and um, put it in the context of culture and really grappled with with the significance of what is in the in the book and what the author is trying to bring across and that just may that is the most inspiring thing that we can possibly do is is give that kind of sense of um, recognition. And really, in many ways, that's what Porchlight is all about. You know, a lit por- Porchlight indicates that someone is home, you know, that you're welcome here to come and knock on the door. We would love to have you come in and, and have a conversation with us because it's really about the person um, who approaches and has needs and problems for us to solve. And that is... Um, you know, we we can't do what Google and Amazon does, so we do what we do best. All right, since you said the porch light's on, how do people reach out to you, Sally? How do people reach out well, to you? <laughs> our number, of course, our number was 800-CEO-READ, which was our name, and it is still our phone number. <laughs> so That's we can great. still be reached by that phone number. Um and um, but otherwise, uh, our you know you can go to our new website, which is gorgeous and has uh, all of our pictures, and it really conveys a wonderful sense of what our company is about. And we have an about page where you can see all of our specialties. You know, we have um, marketers, we have customer service people, we have salespeople um, who will do special. You know, any. Any scenario that you can think of, if you're an author or publisher that you need help with, our salespeople can have that discussion with you and, and offer solutions. And um, So everyone is available at their first name at porchlightbooks.com. And um, we would love to engage with um, all of the potential ideas that, that people bring to us. So I'm going to guess that you don't have more than one person with a name since you said it's first name at Porchlight, so there's not two Sallies. <laughs> right, there aren't two Sallies. We do have a Michael and a Mike, but they work in different divisions. Um, but we also, um, yeah, so we welcome one-on-one contact, which is something that we're very proud to be able to do. I'll never forget the first time Right when my book was coming out, I got a phone call that a bank wanted to put my book in a gift bag at a um, mm-hmm. major golf event. So it was going to go out to over 300-plus women. Mm-hmm. And I had four days, four days, to get them copies of a book because they right. hadn't decided what to do. They met me, and they called me. And I called you guys up, and I think it was Michael I spoke to, and he goes, mm-hmm. I can make this happen for you. <laughs> I mean, literally, yeah. we had to get the books, put a tip in page, and get them delivered in four days for this event. And then yep. didn't know it, but they asked me to do a book signing live at the event. And it was the customer service was nothing like I had ever experienced. But beyond that, the caring, you guys were so excited for me over the fact that I had this opportunity, and you're like, we are going to figure out a way to make this happen. Now, yeah. granted, the shipping costs were very, very high because they had to be overnight <laughs> to make it happen. Mm-hmm. The customer covered right. all that. They didn't care to do that. And that's, I think, really who Porchlight is as a company is they're going to go that extra mile. You're going to go that extra mile. And I love the rebranding of it. And I'm so excited for you and for your sharing with my listeners 
a new way of thinking, a, a new way of asking about their own businesses because everybody's afraid of what their competitors are doing. And really what you've talked about, Sally, is don't be afraid of that. Just know who you are. Right. And Follow your humanity, you know. That's, yeah. that's what we're here for. But, yeah, that can get so lost often. I mean, I know one of your loves is, is business strategy, mine as well. Mm-hmm. And it, it, to my listeners, what would you say to them is the one thing you want them to be asking themselves with their businesses and their passions and, and their humanity going forward? I think that, it, you know, you can look at, any number of strategy books and um, to some degree they they narrow down into the same um, message and that is to determine what you're best at shed the things that you're not good at and I think this is where people get very um, distracted right, is um, we need to improve X in order to compete. And so you put all of these energies into X and you forget about A. You forget about that A thing that you do the best because you're so trying to do all the rest of the alphabet. And for a long time, we focused on business books and the logistics. And that was our A game, right? Right. But then as we, as we mastered that, we started realizing that other people could benefit from those services and what we do best can be offered to other people and to a more diversified marketplace. And so you're not limited when you concentrate on A, when you concentrate on what you do best, you're not limited only to that market but you can develop the skills that it takes to expand into different areas that you are self-directing rather than being directed by your competitors. I love that. I had this image of a sailboat where you're Mm. tacking and you're moving and you can choose to just go the way the current takes you or you can find that wind and turn your sail Mm -hmm. into it and go, hey, I can chart my course this way. I don't have to just go where the current takes me. I can find that wind, my A, my who, my main is, and go, I can go over there, too. I love that. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. And we're almost at the end of the show. I can't believe it. As (laughs) always, the show always goes way too fast. (laughs) Uh, I want to thank you so much for being here on the show with me, Sally. I mean, when I reached out to Blythe to find out where we can go forward and and to have you on the show, and she said, Sally's a person. I'm so glad she did because you've been a, a fantastic guest. Thank you so much. I really am appreciative of the opportunity. All right. And everybody, if you missed any part of the show, you can always catch us on podcasts, listen to Around the World. And just a few short weeks ago, we were ranked 135 in the United States on iTunes for entrepreneurship. And we're ranking in the 400s around the world. So I'm really excited about that. But what I really love is being here with you each week and go over to Porchlight Books, see what they're talking about. And uh, remember, the right questions can change your life. And download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today. 